this is completely unprepared, but um, <laughs> I was recapping. So I was introducing you, Mono, <laughs> as um, someone I met in the context of the gender and queer parties uh, you've been uh, setting up, um, uh, which uh, aims for creating uh, safer spaces for uh, queer people. Um, being especially based in Rotterdam, that's where they're taking place, and uh, defining itself as gender clone, uh, <laughs> particularly in that context, um, pronouns they, um, and um, having uh, set up like a sort of community center, at least that's how I define it, maybe it's like a different name you probably would give it, uh, where you, around which you're organizing um, different events together with, I'm um, very bad with uh, um, names, but like... Um, you mean the Hangout? Yeah. Yeah, the, the Hangout, hangout I started with uh, Fred Young for Bone, yeah. yeah. And Olaf was also involved. And that's where I met Manon. So when, uh, when Svenja approached me and asked me whether I was interested in doing something with the Army of Love that had to do with community and care and so on, the first person I had in my mind was, I'm going to do this with Manon. So <laughs> Um, because all of those things you just mentioned, the gender Men in queer party, which has become quite an important place for community, the hangout, which has become also a very <laughs> important sort of um, platform for community and activism in Rotterdam, and uh, a number of other things I have I know that Manon does that I feel are very that inspire me in any case. So when they said. You know, you want to do something with the Army of Love, I thought, um, how about I have a conversation with Manon about many of the things that I sort of, you know, um, that I talk and discuss with Manon about, about community care, love, fucking, all of those things. And so I was interested in that as a way of uh, perhaps analysis of sharing information and, 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 and creating knowledge together. And I want to do that more often. And this is my first one that I get to do in this kind of setting. And I'm very, very happy I can do that with you, Manon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's very funny because we have worked together a couple of times, quite some times already. But mostly it's like uh, it's it's in a kind of a talk or a discussion group. And I uh, lead the, the conversation. And Olave is mostly one of the guests with a lot of expertise about the subject. So I ask Olava a lot of questions about her experiences and stuff. Um, yeah, so this is a bit out of my comfort zone, I guess, <laughs> as well, which is good because yeah. awkwardness is one of the most important things, I guess, when you talk about safer spaces. Exactly. Yeah. We excel at awkwardness. Yeah, that's for sure. yes. <laughs> and, um, but I think that that's really important. I, I want to sort of talk about our vulnerability as um, as people who are having a conversation and, and, and sort of the sort of the, 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 the dynamics of this kind of engagement with an audience, so to speak. I'm not here to sort of preach or lecture and, and I would appreciate it if what I, ha what I get to share, what I you know, put in this space and share with you, that it's taken in the humility <laughs> of it all. Like I'm not sort of um, here to tell you what to do and if you feel there is, you have a disagreement, you don't agree, we can talk, but you know, like I'm not here to sort of prove anything to anyone, right? And um, so I think that it would be really nice if we can commit to taking care of one another here as well, and also taking care of us as sort of facilitators of this conversation. What we, we also already tried this a couple of times and, and I really like doing it, so I wanna do it here as well. Um, as it comes to like um, creating a safer space, very literally, uh, we, we would like to, uh, get comfortable in this little space here um, and adjust to it a bit and try to try it out a bit and, and explore it a bit by just walking through it, um, sitting down, maybe, I don't know, you can lie on the floor or, or crawl or maybe uh, um, look, look at each other or not or like, I will, I will guide you through it but maybe it's a good way to start with standing up if you want to. If you, if you want to sit down, it's also fine. I'm going to find a space where I'm comfortable <laughs> to talk about this. So if I could have your attention for a second. Um, I think it works, works best if we all try to do this in silence. Um, yeah, and just, I don't know, walk around. Uh, 
explore the dark corners, like what's here on the side, these curtains. And so what we usually do is to try and create a safer space for queers and their allies. So if you're not queer, we hope you're an ally. Otherwise, there's something at stake. And we explicitly ask non-queers to be modest and treat us with respect. We need you all to take care of us and to take care of each other. And where do you feel like staying for a while? Who's passing by? And if you feel like staying somewhere, please do. I see some of you already do that. With somebody or alone. Try to let your body decide. And what's also important to us is to create a different order. An order starting in equality in taking up space. And we challenge those who are very comfortable taking up space to donate some, some of that comfort to others who might be less privileged. And we challenge those who are awkward or uncomfortable to trust us and to trust the others. And this might be a good time to find a place where you think you would be comfortable to have a conversation with us and each other. To remember our bodies are all beautiful. Beauty standards are fascist. Gender is not binary. This space is one, and we are here with our bodies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We are here being quite vulnerable, I think, and we're going to talk with you about vulnerable stuff. And in order to do so, I think we can ask uh, something in return, and that is um, to kind of know a bit who we're talking to. And this is quite important to me. I, I myself cannot really talk for five minutes or longer to people that I don't know. I don't know how they are receiving it and I don't know what they think of it. So for me, it's, it's important to, to, do di to do this and I don't want to uh, put you on the spot or something, but you know, just to explain why, why for me that's important good. to do. That's good. Um, do you want to get started then? Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. My name is Yumi, and in this space, they, please. Welcome. Hi, my name is Minka. Pronouns are they, them. Aranda, they. I'm Michelangelo, he. Mafalda, she, or they. Susanna, she. Tamara, she. Karen, she, or they. Tara, she. Asya, she. Hi, he. Hi, Matt. He. Hi, Matt. Hi, Matt. Hi, Hi, Matt. Hi, Matt. Hi, Matt. Hi, Matt. Hi, Matt. Hi, Matt. Hi, uh, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to have a conversation and, um, you know, you can jump in. If you hear anything that inspires you and that moves you, you know, go ahead and jump in. Um, I think what we, I've learned in the, in the NA program that um, what we try to do is like when you speak for, uh, for we, you're sort of like, you know, preaching or day, like but just, if it comes from your own space, from your own place, from your own personal history, please share, speak in the I form, and they and, uh, and, uh, and you and we and so on is not really, <laughs> um, is not conducive to sort of egalitarian conversation, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking. I'm, I'm sorry. I was, you know, like, I, zoning I, I out. zoned out for yeah. a bit. <laughs> so as, I, as you all know, in the, in the, in the, um, 
in the uh, event description, there are a number of themes that I wanted to talk to you about, Manon. Mm. And one of the themes I want to talk about was community. Um, Tell me something new. <laughs> we talk about this so often, it's ridiculous. <laughs> um, and yesterday, actually, I was having another really great conversation where I just came to a further sort of sense of the urgency of community. I was with a friend whom I know mostly from the anti-racism sort of activist groups in, in, in Holland. And this person is sitting in my living room and specifically really saying to me, I don't feel seen as a human being. I don't feel supported by the community. And at some point, like he told me, like, uh, if I don't cr produce, if I don't create content, like, an, you know, sort of analytical content, if I don't write, if I don't tweet, um, these people who are allies and who are comrades, who are sort of my fellow colleagues in this sort of liberation work, forget about me. And, and that really resonated with me. And I was, I was struck by the loneliness that I feel that he was telling me about. And, uh, very and existential. Yeah. <laughs> Very existential. And that's what made me think, first of all, and I want to talk to you about that. Like, what, 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 is, what are your community? What is your community? What are your communities, perhaps? And how do you, how do you, you know, um, designate a particular group of people as your community? Right. I feel, I feel like I have a very solid network around me right now okay. and um, I feel that is the case because mm -hmm. I selected them very carefully mm -hmm. um, and um, I got this opportunity because of the because that I because of the party I started the gender bending queer party I think it was three or four years ago uh, um, on my own and after two editions I found out that that was not very possible to do it on my own. So um, I started to think about creating a, a group of people around me that I wanted to organize it with and that could help me. So I started thinking about who is it that is actually queer because it's a queer party, so it should be like there's a certain ethics that people... <coughs> I don't want to explain that first, so I want the people to explain that already, to, to understand that already. Mm -hmm. And second, I want it to be people who really, who I really feel supported by, and not. Uh, so when when it comes to like uh, organizing the party at the night itself, uh, who can like really, who I can lean on. Mm. Um, and I started thinking about who, who in my surroundings and who of my friends would suit that. <laughs> Because you also, you also told me in the beginning when you invited me to help with the, with the, with the gender bending queer party. Yeah. Um, I remember you told me about how you look at people whom don't necessarily click, that don't necessarily, not click, but don't necessarily sort of congregate in these sort of super exclusive little groups right. that don't, because none of us really, <laughs> except for your sister, none of us really sort of had very strong bonds with one another before you mm -hmm. put us all together in the gender bending queer party right yeah and 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 i remember you said that and i thought about how for me also i've always had a lot of troubles with groups like sort of like groups that are <laughs> that identify themselves as really close and very sort of and like how easy it is to feel excluded from them and how easy these kind of groups tend to create like sort of rules of who belongs and who doesn't like right. I've always felt outside of everything and when you were talking about how you pick people who don't necessarily that whom you felt weren't gonna become like this really cohesive exclusive group I thought that was really interesting because I was I was already afraid that everybody when you invite me everybody knew each other already and I was gonna come and there was gonna be this sort of checklist on what I had to be and who I had to sort of prove myself to be to be part of the group. And when it comes to forming groups um, because of peer pressure and because of you coincidentally are in the same classroom or mm. basketball team <laughs> or whatever, um, I, f I feel like um, there's, always, there's always people that you wouldn't have, maybe wouldn't have uh, clicked with 
but they're just in the group, right? Mm. Um, so, so maybe that's I don't know. I haven't really thought about this before your like before this moment. But maybe that's that's um, that's a good question to ask. What what happens then? I think maybe it has to do with if people um, don't explicitly come together because of a certain politics or a certain a uh, certain goal like organizing a party that maybe there's this implicit difference that you have to bridge because of um, you know because otherwise you you wouldn't be able to be friends mm. but there's this gap I don't know but you don't you don't invite just anyone in the gender bed who has the right politics right no, not just anyone who has the right politics. So. And what is the right politics? Well, that's not interesting. Also <laughs> <laughs> because I wonder, when I see how we are together, the gender bed and queer party people, and I've told you that by now it feels like it's a family, like it's become so, not just the party, but the little community around has become so crucial to my sense of, of belonging. And I look at how we, I don't always feel like we necessarily, all of us align around the same kind of politics. No. There is quite some diversity though in the yeah. group, right? Yeah, I think um, so. There are some people whom I can say things and, you know, like, uh, that might go like, what, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and you get a lot of things I say, <laughs> I think. <laughs> you act like you do. You should ask me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but, for example, this person I was talking to yesterday talked about feeling as if they are too much, that, the, that, they're gonna, that there are people in the community, the anti-racism community, that um, exclude them on the basis of their politics. And then I thought, but is politics a good enough reason to be in community with one another? And for a second there, I didn't know whether I should advise him to, so I don't know, to find just as radical people as he is, or whether I should encourage him to create bonds that go beyond whether or not you have the perfect analysis of, of what Chimamanda said yesterday or something, you know? Mm -hmm. Do you recognize any of that at all? No, I think I say, the, I say this a lot the last, the last couple of weeks and it's kind of cheesy, but I think that's what relationship therapists say. I think I read it in the Argonauts, like the, the thing about do you want to, do you want to be right or do you want to get closer mm. to each other? And I feel, I think maybe that's an important thing, you know, if, if you talk about politics and being friends and... I do activism, I do politics for, for healing, mm -hmm. to get out of my house, to be with people whom, you know, like I, do, I go to demos, not necessarily because I think that if I go to a demonstration, everybody, you know, who sees us pass by will go like, <gasps> Now, that makes sense. We're going to just stop <laughs> racism now, <laughs> you know? But I go there because I will meet people who have these wounds as well and who, you know, are together, united, and I hope to touch them, to talk to them, to invite them for dinner, to, you know, uh, to feel like I'm not alone mm -hmm. and, and, and also to have something to do. You know, because Twitter just keeps, and timeline, my Facebook timeline just keeps unfolding just how broken the world is. Mm -hmm. And and I want to be mended, so I look for people, I want to be sort of healed, so I look for people. <coughs> that's where I, that's I think the reason why I do activism, and that's the reason why I think for me com community is so important. Mm -hmm. Because just going off to all the demos yeah. is great. Mm -hmm. But I need to have the time that we sit together, eat together, party together tell each other our stories, heal, right? I mean, does that, which makes me really happy about how we do the gender bending queer party. And I wonder, like, do you, because I see also the other work that you do with the hangout and so on, like how important is this element of healing and care in terms of your community and activism? Does that resonate what I'm saying with you right now? Like, you go like. <laughs> how important yeah. on a scale from. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if if I start talking about the the community and politics of care or or like um, ethics of care, I feel like I'm always also a bit uh, not not doing it enough or something. Okay. You know, I feel like I'm also being t 
test it a bit if I'm like mm. focusing the attention on yourself and, and at the same time just abandoning your friends, you know? I wanted to tell him that I felt that I had also failed him. Right. You know, and I didn't know how to promise that I was going to do better. Yeah. And at some point I tried to sort of be like, okay, so how about we have this once a month, you know, <laughs> come over for dinner at my house. And that felt, I did feel like that that was a bit flat. And what do you mean flat? Because I feel like, is it okay to say to somebody, I tried to, at some point I felt like I just have to say it. It's like, I love you. I care about you and I want to do more. And I feel like I failed you. You know, because he's been really important for me when I started transitioning. And I wanted to say, like, I really want to do better by you. But it felt sort of that that's not okay to say or something, that that's too big of a thing to say. Like, it was Why? <sighs> also because I feel like maybe I don't know how to, do, how to be a good friend or something. And how to be a really good carer in, within our community, our communities. And because I was obviously already, I had already failed him. Yeah. You know, I hadn't talked to him maybe in two months. And he wrote me an email asking me to meet up. And then I forgot to answer it for like about a week. <coughs> then he sent me another email basically saying, I don't know if you're still, but because he has some uh, cush, like pillows in his house. He's like, I'm, I can come and drop them off and, you know, be on my way. And I was like, oh, wow, like, you know, and so... What do you promise at that point? Mm -hmm. You know? <laughs> and this is somebody whom has you know, inspired me so much on intellectual level on, 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 and connected me to so many people. And he's sitting in my house and telling me that he doesn't feel supported. You know, what do you say at that moment? So I think I can sort of... <laughs> and I talk a lot, I talk a big game about care, right? You've heard me a lot about care. Yeah. And, <laughs> and my friend is sitting there and saying, no yeah. one has taken care of him. No, that's what, I, yeah, that's what I mean. But I guess, you know, maybe it's, it's the same as we try to do here because that's why, that's why it's a bit awkward also because we're talking now about it and I feel like we're failing. Like, as we sit here talking about community and care, we're failing at it because we're just sitting here talking about it. So, I don't know. It's this is not the work, though? Maybe. But it's also about asking other people to take over and to, and to help, I guess. Because you can't, we cannot do it uh, by ourselves. So the only thing you can do is, like, I won't manage without you, so... Help me. Please help me. So should, do you, wait, wait, are you saying that I should have basically said to him, I want to be there for you, but you got to help me be there for you. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Maybe. I wanted to say that, like, you got to remind me. Yeah. You know, uh, you know I'm very bad at, uh, at, because I also feel like I am too much. Like, if I start writing a message every day to you, like, I feel like I am too much. Like, I'm bothering people. So I should just wait till they have time for me or something, mm. and that's my hang up. And would, would it be okay to tell him like, but doesn't that sort of, that sort of victim blame? Like if you had told me, I would have been there for you type of thing. <laughs> and who's the victim? <laughs> yeah, the defense, are you blaming? Or are you just showing your own like realistic capability yeah. as a human being? I see what, what you're doing there. I see what, you're, <laughs> what you think of my game. <laughs> uh, no, I'm, I am concerned a little bit because also with the, with the Hangout, for example, a lot of the kids that we do get to see have like a very serious traumas and pains and wounds. Mm -hmm. And I position myself um, in, the, in the sort of community and I talk a lot about taking care of one another like, uh, but I feel like I need to, like, I should know what to do. Yeah, I guess in a way, responsibility is a, is a way of caring. And I wanted to ask something too, because <coughs> both of you were talking about anxiety around failure. 
but they cry if they no. <laughs> <laughs> what nothing <laughs> But like not having the the history of feeling comfortable in certain groups. Mm. So, if you could start up a community, how would you want people in there to have their their their? Um, how how would you want them to create a unity? Because I think that you maybe did not feel the unity of that group that you felt excluded from mm. so what is that significant factor that you need in your own community to you know clear that out and actually bring more people in like you or mm -hmm. more open people i don't know if we bring it to the party i feel like i feel i feel like our our club night is a club because uh, clubbing is very specific so when i was thinking about about hosting a party. I've been a clubber. I've always been a clubber. But I've, I've also uh, always been very awkward in situations in clubs and very self-conscious, self-aware of my body and of how other people perceive that body and, you know, stuff like that. Um, but I also felt like there's this certain type of freedom that comes with clubbing. Uh, as if you are all together, all these individuals in this vacuum, and you're kind of like, it doesn't really matter where you come from, but it's just, it's just this vacuum, and you can just be there. Uh, and when the circumstances are, 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 are good, then it can be like heaven. But it's very specific. If there's one or two circumstances not good, like uh, a group of straight cis guys within certain, like, within very close areas, <laughs> then it can be very threatening and unsafe and not good at all. Even though the DJ is very good and you're, all your friends are there. So I felt like it's very in it was a very interesting playground for me to be at and to reflect <coughs> upon my body and my self-consciousness and my friends and the way I relate to everybody. And you know, there's also, it's going out, so it's also about sex and about flirting. And there's so much going on in the club night. That's so interesting. But I also have a lot of friends who are very socially awkward and not clubbers at all. Um, and I felt like, I felt like they also needed, you know, they, they also deserved, <coughs> <laughs> like it's really weird to say it like that. But I felt like they would really like a certain type of club night if it were a safe one. So that's one of the main reasons why, that's one of the, the main focuses of the gender men and queer party, I feel like it's also a, a club night for not clubbers mm -hmm. and for people, for people who have like more like anxiety, social anxiety or social awkwardness and are not very comfortable per se uh, in groups, stuff like that. The gender vending party, the club scene as some sort of scene that would resemble something that you would want in your community? Yeah, I think so. I think it's kind of like where every every individual can try to find their place in a certain way, in a certain way of behaving and and relating to others and try it out there. Mm. And then, you know, it's kind of a trial version of real life. Um, yeah, and if and if people can use it for that, I think it's very uh, helpful to afterwards go back into the real world and and also think about like what community is and how you relate to others yeah. in that world yeah i'm really because okay now you started i thought you were going completely different direction mm -hmm. but now you've ended up exactly where i wanted to start <laughs> wow uh, because i feel like <laughs> yeah wow <laughs> uh, i like it but uh, um i do i do often feel like I'm like I think a lot about what I didn't get growing up about the the safety and the nurture and the sort of support system that I didn't have in high school at home um, the erasure all the violence I feel like a lot of how I look at, at sort of uh, groups and communities at like am I do I recognize anything that feels like 
old pa patterns, you know? <laughs> and I get very anxious and very like, okay, I need to be out of here if I get the sense, when, when you have like these alpha males that start sort of dominating everyone, instead of telling, I'm out. Like, it's cute, but I'm out, <laughs> you know? Um, I've been to like uh, anarchist groups where, you know, like I will go out with them and then before you know it, like we're dancing in this sort of like Freiplatz, you know, like a free anarchist space and then behind me somebody will slap me on my ass and I turn around and everybody's acting like and have people tell me like, but don't you like that? Why are you dancing like that? I'm out, <laughs> you know? Um, and a lot of these sort of triggers, I take them very seriously now and that informs me when it doesn't feel safe. But I also sometimes feel that because of such a like sort of persistent uh, history of violence in the communities that I was part of, sometimes I feel ill-equipped to create safe environments for other people. And what I do like about people like Manon is that they, like here also, they, like the way you just did that, like just reminds me I don't have to do it alone anymore, right? So, um, and right now, also another thing I'm sort of playing with is I'm playing with sort of thinking of systems where not necessarily people won't fuck up because this sort of triggered thing that I have when I see something happening that reminds me and I run um, doesn't feel adequate anymore. And I'm starting to think of what can I bring to the table with my background and think of ways that we can create systems where we can hold each other accountable and not necessarily just run away, mm -hmm. you know? Um, where we can talk about like, well, what you said hurt, it was racist or was this or was that? And how do we as a community um, take care of one another and yeah, we were just talking about that actually today on my couch, about accountability systems. So I'm very interested in that as well in, and, and how that, so that, that, that the community of itself is something that will grow and that will like sort of mature and that I don't have to do alone but I can perhaps bring in this sense of like how about we create systems that difficult conversations can be had I was thinking of the same thing because if you would take your concept and your concept and you would both have a community, if you would make those community work, <laughs> communities work together at a certain point, you would get a much more complex system. Mm. And if that like becomes bigger, it becomes more open-minded because you get different, uh, how do you say that, different visions every time because your vision was more like you want something that is more cozy, like like clubbing and, and forgetting about the world. And yours was more like a, a, nurser, a nursing, like nurturing mm -hmm. kind of scene. So if you would bring those intentions of several people all into one community and they would all make a system out of that, that would be... Mm -hmm the most open community ever. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Which we're trying. Yeah. Activism, community as an activist space. As a space that when you build and you know, sort of spend time and effort in bringing that together, my vision, and there are more people that we know that were sort of part of our community, like Sana, for example, you know, and, uh, and I wonder like whether or not, and this may be sort of an anarchist sort of idea of like, isn't it more important the spaces where we come together, the, the communities and the, the sort of these activist uh, 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 networks, <clears throat> that if we first figure out there at that level um, what the alternatives are to these patterns of, of oppression <laughs> that we see outside, you know, like I see people, you know, I've sat in, in sort of action meetings, right, where people are literally, they sound to me, like the boardrooms I used to be sitting at when I was a corporate lawyer. It sounds the same. You know, it's like, where's the efficiency and the productivity, like, <laughs> index? It, like, that's the only difference. No one is sitting there saying, you work that many hours, you know? And, and I wonder, do we really offer an alternative if we don't, also in the places where we are together, where we're organizing, if we're not coming up with alternatives, if we're not applying it? You can clap. No. <laughs> <laughs> what did you did you just? Was, was that, that was my point. Was <laughs> <laughs> you know, let's like isn't isn't the community in and of itself and the organizing spaces and groups aren't they like part of being an, like 
Can we be activistic about that as well? And I think you are, for example, very much. Right? Well, what do you mean? For example, um, um, let me give you an example. For example, when I had, we had um, uh, 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 pictures taken for the Genebed and Queer part that I had a lot of issues with. And I just was having a terrible time. And I felt that you were very much in the group, when I shared it with the WhatsApp group, in the WhatsApp group, that you were very much like making sure that it wasn't about sort of like, that it wasn't like, um, that, the, that your ideas about the beauty standards and how fascist they are, that that was something that was sort of like uh, clear, that I shouldn't necessarily um, think of myself uh, like, w am, I, am I beautiful when I fit these and these requirements or not? Like you were like, yes, we could take away the pictures, but you were very much also like you're not, you don't have to be thin to be beautiful and to be worthy of being taken a picture of and so on. I felt that very much from you. Right. And that to me feels like, you know, we, we, the activism that we talk about, like beauty standards are fascist and so on, and you know, we, you know, we talk about fat phobia, and we want to, you know, blah, blah, blah in, the, in, the, in, the, in the party, and we talk about that, but you also apply it. Yeah. In our little community as well, and I really right. like that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's one of the, the most, the, one of the strongest things that you can do is to like, uh, you know, um, try to explore uh, what's actually happening when you, you know, when you, when you're in a group of people and you talk about uh, creating safer spaces and, and beauty standards and stuff. Um, we do it as we speak, you know, mm -hmm. we're there as well with our bodies. And, um, you know, I, I, I hear a lot from people that they think that I'm really um, confident because I run around naked at my parties. Yeah, but, of course, yeah. <laughs> but of course, I do that because I feel like there has to be a place where I can do that mm -hmm. without feeling uh, standardized or without feeling judged. And if that place, I, and, and if there will, will be a place, it, it has to be, you know, created by myself mm. with my own standards, I guess. Yeah. And if I cannot make that happen, then it's not good enough, probably. So I feel like I should, but I also feel like if I don't feel like doing that at that point because I'm feeling vulnerable or something, or if you, you know, with the picture incident or if anybody else from our team we, we always dress up together in the beginning and mm -hmm. you can always, in the, in the dressing room, you can always sense a bit like where everybody's at, how, how everybody's feeling and who's tired and insecure and who's feeling very like in a party mood and is up for everything. And mm -hmm. you can feel the differences and, and feel the differences in what, what kind of outfit, outf outfits we pick. And, uh, and I, th I think that that's exactly what we try to work with when the party starts and we open our space to, to the others, yeah. that they can try stuff out and they you know, can feel how that, how that works at that moment for mm -hmm. their bodies. And if they, if they feel like taking clothes off is something that gains more freedom or if taking clothes off is something that puts you in a cage, that's, mm -hmm. can, that's like a very delicate yeah. thin line between two things. We, I want to also talk about, about sex. Ew. Really though, really though, really though, really ill. Really? Well, are we out of time? <laughs> I don't know. It's it's. What time is it now? I don't actually know. Svenja, how about it? It's nine. It's nine o'clock. Yeah. Don't go on six, please. You want? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you came for that. You all came for the fuck yeah. Yeah. So we're gonna do a show and tell. <laughs> uh, no, but, uh, I think we have a time. Yeah. Yeah, uh, can you handle that? Is that okay? Or are you like, of course, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. I wanted to specifically talk to you about sex. Okay? <laughs> Why? <laughs> because, you know, like, okay, so many of the things that we do together, <laughs> like there is people fucking in the same places that we and you go. <laughs> whether it is at the gender belly queer party, <laughs> whether it's at kink play parties where we go and host a gender talk or this and that, at some point or another, 
people get to fucking or spanking or play. Like there is always that happening around you and me. Mm-hmm. And so it's not like I see a pattern, but I'm, I'm, and I thought that is something that to me feels also very new. Like I've I've also been in a lot of activist spaces where even when people start having relationships like within the group that there's sort of looked down upon, like because we're here for the cause, we're not here for like, you know, uh, <laughs> sort of dating each other, the words sort of frowned upon. And a lot of what we discuss, in, especially in the white supremacist society, a lot of what we discuss in terms of oppression and people being categorized, always at some point or another, also touches on these ideas of what is uh, uh, of sexual morality, right? Uh, so aside from reason, so nobody's supposed to be emotional, but people, there's a lot of sort of, in white supremacist spaces, there's a lot of constraints on sex. And one of the ways that, that those constraints are kept in place is when it comes down to people's worthiness to be physically intimate. You know, when you, as a female identifying person, for example, uh, when you're sexual, like your worth is reduced, right? So if you talk about, if you claim your sexuality, you're a slut, you're so, somehow like run through these sort of, these tropes of, of, of sort of female sexuality as something that needs to be preserved and kept really, you know? Um, sort of femme, femme sexuality in the same way. And I've been thinking about how perhaps the reason why all these things that you seem to do and I, we seem to be doing together involve sex or somehow or another, have a lot to do with this sense of creating worthiness for one another and upholding each other's worthiness and rec recognizing each other as worthy of not only of liberation, but also of affection, of intimacy, of love, of pleasure. Because I think we bring a lot of people pleasure. <coughs> yeah, no? Can you write this down? It's yeah. so cute. <laughs> And I wonder whether you do you do you think of it that way as well, or am I just completely sort of trying to theorize about something that you don't even like, you know? Because it's it is common. It's it's a common thread in everything. Yeah, I guess. Um. I mean, if we if you don't, right? If you if you don't if we don't fuck each other, what are we doing it for? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Am I just missing a point here? <laughs> um, I don't know what to say. What's the question? The question is, do you... <laughs> or maybe other people here want to sort of chime in on this. Like, do you... Because... I have also noticed that when I'm, for example, in spaces, for example, anarchist space, or you know, like where there is a lot of like, let's get to the 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 the, the struggle and the all right. and the theory and the you know, and it's all about that. But people don't touch each other, mm. uh, and if people sort of start dating, it's in secret, you know, uh, you know, and and. It, no, and certainly not like when you were at your house and people, you create a space, like we will have a house party at Malone's house and then they will uh, make sure that in the bathroom there are blankets and like cozy places to fuck. The motivation for me to, to create uh, sex spaces or, or spaces where you can be sexy if you want mm -hmm. is I think mainly because of pleasure, but also I feel like it's, it's kind of, body politics, I don't know, it's, it's, it's about sharing mm. body as well and, yeah. and, uh, and pleasure and without, uh, uh, and without even